I encourage you to find your place in God's Word, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 34, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. This morning, if you've been reading ahead, you know that we're coming to the issue of anxiety or worry, and I've got to say at the outset that I'm not sure I've got a whole lot of credibility on this topic. Uh, You see, I come from a long line of worriers, all the way back to Adam in the garden. We have a predisposition uh, due to our sin to worry about the stuff of this world. And I think it also bears noting that this issue of worry and anxiety is not just an issue that affects the godless or just affects those who have no faith. Uh, I've been reading through the Bible. If you've been doing the walk through the Bible, you too are in the book of Psalms and uh, or at the end of Job. And, and uh, in Psalms, if you read the Psalms, you can't help but see that uh, quite often David was very worried about the circumstances of his life. And we're going to talk a little later about how he dealt with that. But Abraham, the great patriarch, Abraham worried. In fact, there were certain circumstances of his life that he worried so much about that he uh, tried to pass his wife off as his sister. Uh, Moses worried. He worried about his ability to to lead God's people and the enormity of the task that God had, had put in front of him. Current stats tell us that 6.8 million uh, U.S. adults are affected by what they call general anxiety uh, disorder. And and listen to this, parents, 25% of all children between the ages of 13 to 18 deal with general anxiety disorder. And the stat is much higher for girls Uh, The stat is that 38% of all girls between the ages of 13 and 18 deal with general anxiety disorder. Folks, that is staggering. And I don't think there's a lot of situations you wonder if we're just hearing more about it, that it's always been a problem we're hearing. I don't think that's the case. I think that this is a... Uh, a problem, an issue that's becoming increasingly more prevalent. We could talk a lot about what is it that's causing the anxiety. Uh, But what I want to do today is on the the basis of God's word, I want to address the spiritual side of this issue. Uh, You need to hear me say this morning, I am not a doctor. Don't play one on TV. I didn't even sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night. I'm not a doctor. Um, and, and you also need to know that I believe that there's a very real and physical aspect to this issue. We've, uh, over the past many years, over the past decade, we've learned so much more about the brain, the body, uh, our emotions, uh, the chemical makeup of our bodies. And, and so you need to hear me say this this morning. If you continually struggle with some anxiety disorder or depression, can I encourage you today to seek help? Seek medical help, seek a Christian or a biblical uh, counselor. I'm afraid that, that um, far too often we uh, as evangelical Christians have a tendency just to moralize, uh, always moralize this issue. And, and quite frankly, a lot of times it is a moral issue. A lot of times our anxiety stems from a very real moral issues, but sometimes it's not. And, and uh, as I just got done finished reading the book of Job, I think sometimes we respond just like uh, Bildad and Zophar and Eliphaz, Job's friends. You remember, he's got this issue in his life, and what is their immediate response? What's your sin? And uh, I think sometimes that's the immediate response of us as the church and evangelical Christians. And, and there are times, I think, when this is not a moral issue. A lot of times it is, but sometimes it's not. And so if that's you out there, I want to encourage you to seek a good biblical counselor who can help you walk through that. So uh, as a pastor this morning, we're going to attack this issue on the basis of God's word. Let's look at the spiritual side of this issue, because the reality is we live in a world that is constantly anxious. We're living in the midst of the world that is losing their minds, and we're to be a people who trust in God. We're to be a people that have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it sounds nice, doesn't it? We're just to have this peace. But the question is, how do we get there? Well, you remember last week we dealt with with money and wealth and the, the great danger 
uh, of money and wealth is that we would begin to trust in our possessions more than we trust in God. Well, well this, this week, the issue is not wealth. The issue is worry. Last week, was the, the issue was trusting our possessions. This week, in this passage, it's doubting God's provision. That can we trust that as we set our hearts and minds on God, as we make him the passion and the goal of our life, can we trust him to meet the everyday needs of our lives? So how do we, as believers in Jesus Christ, trust in God and win in this area of worry. So with that in mind, would you stand with me this morning in the honor of reading God's word? We'll begin there in verse 25. Verse 25, it says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Don't worry then, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for that word that speaks so practically into our lives. And God, I pray that for this next few minutes, God, you would help us to lay aside anything that would distract us and turn our attention completely to you and your word, that we might hear your voice. God, that you might draw us to yourself, that we might be molded and shaped more and more in the image of Christ, that we would be a people who trust you in the midst of the world of chaos and worry. May we be a people of peace and trust through faith in Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you look there in verse 25, it begins with this. It says, for this reason I say to you, for this reason I say to you, this, so the question is, what is the reason? Well, we find the reason by looking back in verse 24. You'll remember from last week, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve both God and wealth. In other words, Jesus says, I demand complete and total devotion. And then he goes on, because I demand complete and total devotion, make the focus of your life me. And then he says, don't worry. And the reality is he says, don't worry because all that stuff won't bring fulfillment anyway. I am the only way, Jesus is saying to us, I am the only way to true and lasting fulfillment. In fact, if you look down at the end of verse 25, it says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And Jesus is making a simple statement that true happiness is not found in material possessions. The true meaning, purpose, fulfillment is not found in the, in the accumulation of wealth or in money, but by living in the will of God. In John chapter 4, you'll remember Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. And the disciples have gone off to get something to eat for Jesus and for themselves. And they come back and they're urging Jesus to eat. Rabbi, eat. And you remember he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And so the disciples are, are wondering, did anybody bring him to eat? And we didn't notice. And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus is saying to us both in Matthew and there in that story in John 4, he's saying to us that life is not just for the acquisition of wealth and the processing of food. Life is found in doing God's will and seeking his kingdom, and seeking his righteousness, that you have been placed here for so much more than money, and wealth, and houses, and cars, and clothes, that you, as an eternal being, will never be satisfied with earthly things. You know, it's amazing to me that the message that the world sends to us, and even to our young people, is that you're a cosmic accident. 
that you're the product of time and chance. And this world is all there really is. So in, enjoy life. Do what feels good. Accumulate as much stuff as you can because meaning is found there in the stuff of this world because that's all there is. And then we wonder why there's so much depression and anxiety. Folks, here's the message of God's word that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God made you perfectly and he loves you infinitely despite all your faults, despite all your sins and your brokenness. God loves you and he loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for your sins because he desires a relationship with you. And even more than that, he has a purpose for you. He wants to use you. You were perfectly made by a glorious infinite God who wants to personally know you and use you for a purpose that is so far beyond anything you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Folks, listen to me. This is amazing. We're made for so much more than just the stuff of this world. We were made to know God, to enjoy fellowship with him, and find true fulfillment in doing and knowing his will. We, we got a dog, and you guys, most of you know that, and while he's a very intelligent dog, he... Um, we buy him some nice food, not, not the cheapest food. We don't go the real expensive stuff, kind of in the middle. We're doing all right. We got him some good food. We got him good food. We buy him some dog bones. We buy him some good toys to play with, but some treats also to munch on. And it amazes me. He will go outside and he will proceed to eat mulch. And I'm thinking, what in the world? We have all this here, and yet you will go and feast on stuff that's only going to upset your stomach and leave you in a lot of pain later on, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but you know what I began to think of? Far too often in my life, God has said, true joy and fulfillment is in knowing me and yet I seek to find fulfillment in the mulch of this world that will only leave me disappointed and in the end bring, brings pain. Folks, Jesus is saying life's more than food. It's more than the processing of food and the accumulation of wealth. You want to know real life. You want to know real joy. Know me and get involved in my will and my purpose. Instead, we're so easily distracted. Jesus says, life is in me. Make me the devotion of your heart. And then he proceeds to tell us why we shouldn't worry. He begins in, um, if you look down to verse 26, gives us reasons why we shouldn't worry. Number one, he tells us that worry denies our value to God. He says in verse 26, look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And then if you look down to verse 28, and why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, all his glory was clothed like one of these. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't got a care in the world. And God meets every one of their needs. Look at these lilies over here. They're not concerned about what they're going to put on. And yet they're more beautifully clothed than Solomon in all his glory. And this doesn't mean that we're, we're to float around like birds and sit around like lilies and just expect God to bless. But what Jesus is saying to us is that, folks, if God takes care of birds and if God takes care of lilies, can you not trust him to take care of you who are of infinite worth to him? Listen to me today. You are the centerpiece, man and woman, the centerpiece of God's creation. We alone have been made in his image. The birds of the air haven't been made in his image. The lilies of the field, they have not been made in his image. We have been made in his image. We're of infinite value to God. And if we can know that he takes care of lilies and birds, can we not also trust that he'll take care of us? When you worry, you're denying your infinite value to the heart of God. Secondly, we see here that worry is futile. Worry is futile. Brings no value or benefit to your life. You can worry yourself to death, but you can't worry yourself into a longer life. 
Jesus said, and who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? The most unproductive thing you can do in any circumstance is to worry. And the reality is 90% of what we worry about will never come to fruition anyway, and the other 10% you can't control anyway. So why worry about it? Corey Ten Boone said, worry doesn't empty tom- uh, tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. Worry never improves the future, and it always ruins the present. You can do what one man did. He decided to hire himself a, a professional worrier to do his worrying for him. And he offered the position at $200,000 a year. And the man quickly accepted the position. And his first question to his boss is, where in the world are you going to come up with $200,000? And the man responded, that's not for me to worry about. That's your concern now. (laughs) Folks, worry is worthless. It's unproductive. So here's the question, though. Here's the question. If, If worry is worthless, then what should we do? Do you remember Paul? In Philippians chapter four said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you, when you find yourself in a troublesome circumstance, rather than see it as an opportunity to worry, how about seeing it as an invitation to prayer? Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. God is inviting us, cast your cares on me. I'll take care of you. An invitation to prayer rather than an opportunity to worry. You know, I talked about David earlier. David, you read those Psalms. It always begins about the same way. Boy, I'm in a bad spot, either due to his own sin or the circumstances. People are out to get me. I've sinned. It's a bad place. He's worried. He's concerned. But the more he continues to fix his focus on God and worship, by the end of the Psalm, how does it always end? God, you're great. and I know you'll take care of me. Can I tell you, whenever you find yourself in those troublesome circumstances, rather than worry, if you will pursue Christ in prayer and the power of his word, here's what oftentimes will happen. Your vision of God will be so big, it'll make your problems seem pretty small. Maybe you've heard me say before, we need to stop telling God how big our problems are, and we need to start telling our problems how big our God is. So worry is futile. And rather than an opportunity to worry, let's see it as an invitation to prayer. Uh, Thirdly, worry discredits our witness. Look at verses 31 through 32. Jesus said, do not worry, then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. He says, this is what Gentiles, this is what people who don't know me, this is how they respond, but not you. And we need to understand this today. And if, if all of our conversations, when we're talking with our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends, if all of our conversations are consumed with the concerns of the material things of this world, folks, we lose our distinctiveness. We lose our credibility. You see, we're to be a group of people in the midst of a chaotic world with a lot of uncertainty. Folks, there's all kinds of uncertainty today. There's security concerns. There's national security concerns. There's there's all kinds of economic concerns, political concerns. But we're to be a group of people who abide and rest under the refuge of God's wings and we have peace. And so when they come to us with all their concerns, we tell them about the greatness of our God. See, they ought to be wondering how in the world can you be so peaceful and joyful in the midst of these circumstances and then we have an opportunity to tell them about the greatness of our God who saved us from our sins and secured us eternal destination. So we're not too concerned about this stuff of this world because we know we're gonna be okay. This is about evangelization. This is about the gospel. So when we worry, it discredits our witness Fourth, worry denies God's provision and power. It denies God's provision and power. You know, our actions are driven by our beliefs. So what we do is an indication of what we believe. Well, when we worry, 
What we're saying is at least a couple of things. Number one, we're saying that, God, you, you obviously don't know about my problems. You don't know my circumstances. So, so we're denying God's omniscience. And Jesus says right here, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Listen, God knows your circumstances today. Do you understand that? God knows where you're at. He knows what you're facing. And what Jesus says here, he knows that you have needs. He knows you gotta pay the bills. He knows those things have to occur. He knows that life in this world to some extent necessitates money. He knows the circumstances of your life. And when we worry, we're saying, well, I guess he doesn't know. But not only are we saying, well, I guess he doesn't know, but we're saying that he's not powerful enough to meet our needs. And folks, as Paul said to Philippians, my God's able to meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We serve a big God, but he's also personal. He knows your circumstances and he's able to meet your needs. I had a, a guy in my first church in Alabama um, who was uh, constantly worried about getting prostate cancer. He, every Wednesday night, he'd ask us to pay, pray, for, pray for him. He'd tell us his PSA. I learned more about a prostate than a young minister should ever have to know at that age. And, but every week we're praying about this man. And he, he'd go to Mayo Clinic twice a year and he'd tell us about it and Pray about it. And one of his friends said, boy, if, if Jim don't die of prostate cancer, I think he's going to be disappointed. <laughs> Folks, should we be concerned about our health? Yes. Should we pray about our health? Yes. Should we do all that we can to stay healthy? Absolutely we should. But once we've done all that we can do, don't worry it's an insult to God and his knowledge and his ability to meet the everyday needs of your life. Fifthly, finally, worry distracts us from our work. Jesus said right there in verse 33, a verse we probably all know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And it's really a very simple verse. It just simply means you stay faithful to me. You put me as the priority of your life. Put me as the focal point of your life. And then you can trust that I'll meet your needs. You see, we sometimes get it backwards, don't we? God, once you meet my needs, then I'll serve you. And it doesn't work that way. Jesus says, you trust me, you seek me first, you put me at the centerpiece of your life and then you can trust I'll meet your needs. Philippians, you guys know Philippians is my favorite book. Philippians chapter one, Paul says, make Christ your master passion. He, Paul says, he's, he's my master passion for me to live as Christ and die as gain. In chapter two, he says, make him your model, your example. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In chapter three, he says, make him your goal, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what lies ahead. And the question is, if, if he's my master passion, if he's my model, if he's my goal, if he's all of my life, then who will meet my needs? And Paul says in Philippians 4, and my God shall meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you see the picture here? You set your heart and mind to do my will and to follow me. And then you can trust and rest your head on the pillow knowing I'll meet your needs. I'll take care of you. You know, um, Pastor Brian Griffin's down here. His uh, ordination service was Wednesday. So at Wednesday, so I was reading through Timothy and I love that book in 2 Timothy chapter four. At the end, it's the very end of Paul's life. And Paul is making some requests of, of the elders. And, and, and in these requests, he, he basically, he spends all of his time in his requests. All of his time is consumed by, by asking them, pray for me, pray that I would have boldness, pray that the word would go forth, pray that the gospel would, would move forth in power and co people would come to faith in Christ, pray for an open open door and then he puts in one little line where he basically says bring me a little food little little Casey Joe's a coat and some books that's all I need he says pray for the gospel oh and if you want to meet my needs that's fine too but just pray for the gospel you see Paul got it I don't know about you but far too often the majority of my prayers are centered around my physical needs Paul says, listen, I'm gonna focus in on the gospel 
And I trust God to meet my needs. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for our physical needs. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be concerned about it. But I do believe that as we mature as believers in Christ, and as we see more and more of God's provision throughout our life, the less and less our life will be consumed with physical stuff, and the more consumed we'll be with the gospel and Jesus and the word. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Then look at Jesus how he concludes this section in verse 34. So do not be worried about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus is saying, not only don't worry about your stuff, but don't worry about tomorrow. Now, he's not saying don't plan or don't prepare, but what he's saying is don't put your hope in tomorrow. You don't even know that there'll be a tomorrow. Don't put your hope in tomorrow. Let tomorrow take care of itself. I had a a guy in the same church in Montgomery, Alabama named Billy Hogg, great Christian man, just loved the Lord. He was a business owner, local business owner, had a very successful business. He poured his life into this business. It doesn't mean he wasn't a good husband or father. He was. He was a good husband, good father. But most of his life was consumed with his business. And he had always made plans that one day he would sell his business, they'd buy an RV, and him and his wife would travel the country, and they'd go encourage their grandchildren and children, and, and, and they would invest in their kids' lives. And, and so he, they'd kind of look forward to that day. Well, he got near to selling his business and he even went out and they bought an RV and they put it in the driveway. And right after he sold his business, he found out his wife had cancer. And within just a short time, she passed away. Now, here was a good man who loved Christ, but I never forget what he told me. Here was a man who couldn't even mention his wife without crying. He said to this to me, here was my one regret. I so worried about stockpiling for tomorrow that I forgot to enjoy today. Folks, do you understand this? You can't trust tomorrow. What Jesus is saying, make the most of the opportunities and the resources that I've given to you today. My boys, as they were growing up, Always couldn't wait for that next stage. You know, you're always just as a parent, you're always looking forward to the next thing. I remember thinking, wouldn't it be awesome if they could hold that on their own bottle? Then I don't have to stand there the whole time, you know, and do this. Or they can just hold it. And that was a cool moment. Look at them, they're holding their own bottle. Wow. Woo. And then they get to a point where you say, Boy, I can't wait till they can walk and they can kind of get on their own. I can't wait till they can clothe themselves and they don't need diapers. And I can't wait till they can stay at home by themselves so me and mama can go get something to eat without. And you know what I miss now? I just wish I could go back and hold them. Aren't we always looking towards the future? And what Jesus is saying, listen, let tomorrow take care of itself. I've given you opportunities. Listen to me. God will not hold you accountable, accountable for the opportunities you didn't have and the resources he didn't give you. He will hold you accountable for the opportunities he gave you today and the resources he did give you. Take advantage of the moments God has given to you today because you don't know about tomorrow. Story about the two professional baseball players. I didn't tell the story. The second service, y'all get some extra material here. <laughs> two, two, base, two old guys that love baseball. Two old guys love baseball. And um, George and John, they're walking one day and they say, I wonder if they play baseball in heaven. And John says, well, I don't know, but if I get there before you, I'll come back and tell you. The next day, John dies suddenly. George is walking along a few days later. He hears a voice from heaven. He says, John, is that you? John says, yep, it's me. All right, here's the question. Do they play baseball in heaven? John says, I got some good news and bad news about that. And good news is they play baseball in heaven. Bad news is they got you starting pitching tomorrow. <laughs> Listen, you don't, you don't know about tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow will be. You know, um, take advantage today. Time flies. You know, the ironic part is, is that you live for eternity not by focusing on the future, but by making the most of today. So the question we ought to be asking ourselves is this, how can I take what God has given me today and maximize it for his kingdom and his glory? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Let me just give you some practical advice on this issue of anxiety and worry as we close. Number one, learn to rest. Learn, it's amazing to me. Now, some of you need to learn to work, but that's another, that's another sermon for another day. 
But a lot of us, listen, a lot of us today in the midst of a crazy culture where we have phones and internet access 24 seven, you can't even take a vacation. We're so connected and we get pulled in a million different directions. I see so many young families that are frantically running from one event or one thing to the next. And we need to learn to rest. You realize God set it down as a biblical principle that one day a week you're going to set down your stuff and you're going to remember who gave it to you. You're going to remind yourself that all this stuff doesn't depend upon you anyway. And you're going to be grateful for me. Can I ask you, do you have a consistent time where you just get away, turn off your cell phone and get alone with God? You know, our students every year they go to camp and Pastor Brian, he makes them leave their cell phones behind. And parents always get a little nervous. Whoa, we're sending our kids. Imagine what they do before they had cell phones. But, but we send those kids down there. And Pastor Brian says it always takes them two days to detox. And then all of a sudden they start realizing the beauty of interaction with another human. And then they, and, and they, they focus in on God and their relationships to one another. Do you know what I think? I think sometimes we as parents need one of those camps. Are you resting? to set aside the cares and the distractions. Sometimes the most biblical thing you can do is take a day off, go read your Bible and take a nap. Rest. Secondly, we need to understand parents that it is obvious that anxiety is a growing problem and concern among our children. Anxiety is a growing problem amongst our children. And we could talk till we're blue in the face about all the reasons why that might be. But I'm telling you, Statistics are showing this is becoming a growing, growing concern amongst our children, which simply means this. We've got to be intentional about having conversations with our kids. You know, when our kids are physically ill, we see it and we hurt for them and we intervene. We take their temperature. We determine whether or not we should take them to a doctor. But sometimes emotional needs and anxiety and those types of things are more difficult to, um, to diagnose. You can't see them. And so we as parents, folks, now more than ever, need to be intentional about discipling our children in one-on-one interactions whereby we sometimes ask them hard questions and we dig into their lives and we take their spiritual and emotional temperature to see what they might need. Thirdly, know this. If you're struggling with anxiety or depression, and we know statistics show that anxiety leads to depression, if you're in that place today, if you're in that dark hole of depression or an anxiety disorder, and you're struggling to get out of that hole, seek help. I think sometimes um, we as Christians, we treat counseling like going to see the witch at Endor, you know, Saul and the... Uh, You know, like, uh, folks, we are designed for community and you need other people in your life. And there are biblical counselors. We have people right here at the church who would love to help you. And if we can't, we'll find somebody who can. But you're not intended to go it alone. Don't isolate yourself. Don't be so proud that you wouldn't reach out for a hand to help you. Then finally, Know this, ultimate hope, ultimate freedom can only be found in Jesus. You see, some of you are here today, you're depressed, you're anxious, and it's because you don't know Christ. You've never understood the reality that you've been made on purpose for a purpose. That God is not some cosmic deity that spun the universe into existence and then walked away. This is a God who loves you. Just as Marina, who came to the United States as an atheist. Strange circumstances. Wouldn't it be just like God, the God of all creation, who knew Marina before the foundation of the world? Wouldn't it be just like God to change the circumstances of her life, to move her to the United States, to put her around a Christian so that she could come to know the joy and the hope of Jesus? And can I tell you, that lady has joy in her heart and peace in her heart because of Christ Some of you are here today and you're struggling 
And it's because you don't know the God of all creation who loved you and died for you and desires a relationship with you. And can I tell you what the psalmist tells us? Tells us he tells us to pull up a chair to the table of God and taste and see if he's not good. If you've been feeding on the mulch of this world, can I tell you, Jesus has a feast before you today in him. And if you're there today, Christ is crying out to you, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. There's rest in Jesus. It's the psalm that says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. There's hope in Christ. There's peace in Christ. There's rest in Christ. And you can know him today on the basis of faith and faith alone. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that your word is so very, very practical in our lives that God, we know that this is a very real issue in our world today and there's some people, I know that there's somebody in this room this morning that doesn't have peace because they don't know you. You are peace, you are hope, you are joy. God, I pray that you would penetrate their heart today. You draw them to yourself, that today they'd see the beauty of your love in Jesus who died for them and God, they would come to know your peace today. Know your forgiveness. Know your hope, know your security. God, for those of us that do know you, I pray today, whatever concerns, the reality is there's probably not one person in here today that doesn't have some concern that's weighing heavy upon their heart right now. God, I pray today we'd lay those concerns at your feet. Even as 1 Peter tells us to cast all our cares on you because you care for us. God, we know who you are. We know you're concerned and you know, we know you desire to hear from us. May we lay our requests at your feet and trust that you will handle them and may we know your peace that surpasses all understanding. God, help us today to trust you more and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I wanna invite you to stand with me as we give you an opportunity to respond in whatever way God might be leading on your heart. Maybe you have questions about salvation, how you can know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. We'll have pastors here at the front who would love to talk and love to pray with you. Maybe you'd like to unite with our church family to become a member of Lenexa Baptist Church. You were made and designed for community. Can't go it alone. You need fellowship with other believers. If if you don't have a church home and God is guiding you here, we'd love to receive you. Uh, If you just want prayer for some need in your life, this is your time. Know this today. You will never regret obeying Jesus. So you respond as we sing.